shadows Step out of the grave Break into the wild And don't be afraid Run into wide open spaces Graces waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Graces waiting Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom There is freedom Come out of the dark Just as you are Into the fullness of His love For the Spirit is here about how we're going to lay down our lives and our wants and desires for the heart of God. Let's sing this together. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Let your glory fill this place. We're alive in your presence. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you with nothing more Let your glory fill this place We're alive in your presence We surrender all to you Do what you want to Do what 
you want to God we love to see you move Do what you want to Do what you want to Do what you want to We are standing in your light And our hearts are open wide Let us see more than before Lord, come have your way here yeah. We surrender all to you Do what you want to Do what you want to God, we love to see you What you want to instrument of execution used by the Romans to crucify Jesus. One might ask why we use such a gruesome tool of death as a symbol of our faith. Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 1.8, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is what God does. He takes what is broken, what is intended for evil, and he redeems it for good. That's what the cross is, something that was intended for great evil and persecution, but was ultimately the object upon which God's redemption was carried out. First Peter 2, 24 says this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Let's come together today and sing of God's redemption carried out through the cross.
with mercy now your mercy will be my song and all the glory all the power of the cross oh hallelujah thank you jesus i was a prisoner Now I'm not with your blood, you but my freedom, hallelujah, for the cross, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, I was a prisoner. Father, we sing today not to celebrate the violence and gruesomeness of your death, but rather the everlasting life that it brings. We celebrate today that you take what is broken, damaged, and useless and redeem it for your glory. We come before you broken and useless, but by your wounds we are forever healed. Come, let's sing of his wonderful name. You were the word at the beginning, the one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in
We don't realize it that every day somebody is influencing our minds with millions, maybe uh, tens of millions of messages. Uh, we see it all the time, whether it's advertising or uh, just in relationships, even the clothes people wear. It all has a message to us, and oftentimes it's businesses trying to sell us something. And so they develop something called a brand or a logo. And when you see that, it puts that brand or logo in your mind. So if you're in uh, shopping for something, you might want to pick that brand. So I'm, I'm just curious as to how well these brands work. So I'm going to put some up on the screen, and you shout it out. What, what, what is it? So let's see the first one. You're brilliant when you see that. That is amazing that you got that that was Apple. All right, what, what's this one? Yeah, you, you know your Big Macs. Good. How about this one? So you know Nike, you've got your running shoes on, got your, your Nike gear, good job. I know you're all healthy and stay in shape, well, well done. Um, now how about this one? Well, I hear the crickets chirping. Yeah, it's nobody's logo, I just made that up to see if somebody would say something uh, about it. it. It's interesting though how quickly we recognize the logos of companies that spend billions of dollars just to make sure that we know their brand that we know their company, their products. And, and I often think about what, what would the logo or brand of Jesus be? What do you think? 
Yeah, probably. We'll just put that up there. Take a look at that. This cross is what we often or mostly associate with the Christian faith. And, and, and uh, Micah mentioned it earlier in our worship experience that it becomes that symbol of what ultimately gave us our, our salvation, our forgiveness. It's what restored us to a relationship with God. The truth is, uh, Jesus created, though, a different brand for our faith. And this is something I want you to understand, is that while we wear crosses or we put crosses on churches, ultimately the brand or the logo that he wants people to see is you. The people of God become his representation out in the world. And so we who know him and have received his spirit, we're the ones who reflect the image of Christ in the world. It's more than a symbol. He lives in us who believe. Now, that's why we celebrate Easter, because it's an important reminder to us as the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, on on what it cost for us to know him. He died on a cross, resurrected from the dead, ultimately ascended into heaven, and the promise is that he'll return. And now he has given here, this is the part that people think, I don't know if I get that. He has given his Holy Spirit to every person who believes. Now, let me me just bring you up to speed on that, and we'll unpack it all together. We've been talking about the series Torn, and it's all built on the event that Matthew records when Jesus died on the cross. The veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies in the sacrificial temple of God was torn from the top to the bottom. We knew it couldn't be the earthquake, because if the earthquake did it, it would have been torn in reverse. So it tore from the top to the bottom and was a reflection of or a symbol of the fact that now all people could enter into the presence of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. We've been unpacking it from the book of Hebrews. And so if you have a Bible or a device with the Bible on it, you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. That's where we're going to focus our attention this morning, but we're also going to talk about Mark chapter 11. Actually, all the Gospels record the story of Jesus Christ before uh, coming into, the, the, into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and we call that Palm Sunday. And we remember that today because it has so much to do with the Easter story. If the cross and that veil are going to have any meaning for us, we first have to understand the one who gave them meaning, who ultimately died on that cross. Now, the Hebrew writer was writing to persecuted Christians because they gave their hearts to Christ. They put their faith in him. They were ostracized and persecuted by their families and their communities. And so this writer is trying to encourage them. Now, they probably were Hebrews or Jews who ultimately believed Jesus was their Savior. And as a result, they were familiar with all of those sacrifices that the high priests and the priests would offer for the forgiveness of the sins of their nation. So the writer was inspired to show them the mercy and the sacrifice of Jesus completed the plan of God for their, here's the big word, redemption that completed the plan of God for the restoration of their relationship with the God who made him. So he says, look, because of that, don't give up. And so if you press rewind a little bit to Hebrews chapter 9, it talks a lot about this veil and what happened in it as the high priest would pass through it once a year and put blood or sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant that was behind it. He was the only one who could go through that veil or you would die. And there he shared the sacrifice for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole nation. So he says, look, now Jesus is the one who's done that forever and always. Jesus has come to the world, died on the cross, his blood was shed, and ultimately that becomes the sacrifice for everyone. Thus, the veil was torn, and all now have access to God. Now, beginning in chapter 10, the writer explains that the continuous sacrifices of animals will no longer remove the guilt that they're feeling for their failures, their shortcomings, or sins. 
And then he says this about Jesus, Hebrews 10, beginning with verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Now, the writer is quoting Jesus, quoting Psalm 40. And he's saying, I am this one who has taken on this body to ultimately be the sacrifice for sins. And he's saying to these Hebrew Christ followers, there's a lot of pressure on you right now to abandon this reality. But you've come to believe it. You've come to receive it. Stay with it. Hang in there. And you must always remember this. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for us. Not just them, but now in this generation, you and I ultimately owe our salvation, our forgiveness to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever felt like you were doing everything you were supposed to do and yet it still seems to fall short? I I've been there and I get it. This is what Jesus taught. That all the sacrifices, all the laws that were at one time a good thing only show you how much you need God's mercy. And every sin offering, even the sin offering, which was one of the five offerings they would offer in the temple, it isn't sufficient enough to cleanse you from sin. But Jesus, his pure and sinless body, removes your guilt and washes your spirit that's infected by sin. This is your great opportunity to be restored to God. You see, to understand the cross of Easter, you have to understand the nature of the one compared to your nature. His body was without blemish. His spirit completely pure. His nature is deity, the nature of God. And your nature? Broken and stained and infected by sin. Now, God came in a human body to finalize his redemptive plan for the entire human race, which, by the way, you are one of them. His plan is to make you right with him. Now, you might ask, well, how is it that I'm wrong with him? What makes me wrong with God? Well, that's where this word sin comes in. We all have our ideas of what the word sin means and where our behaviors or our thoughts or our words are elevated or, or, or disintegrate into the level of the word sin. Now, some people think that sin is relegated to simply disobeying rules or God's laws, you know, doing bad things. But the truth is that's only part of it. And Pastor Timothy Keller, a pastor from New York who wrote the book, The Reason for God, has a great definition in that book of what sin is all about. Here's what he says. According to the Bible, the primary way to define sin is not just the doing of bad things, but the making of good things into ultimate things. It is seeking to establish a sense of self by making something else more central to your significance, purpose, and happiness than your relationship to God. Keller's helping us to understand the actual meaning of what was used in the original language to help us see anything you embrace ahead of or instead of a, a relationship with God is an attempt to find your personal identity in something far less than what he designed for you. He wants so much more for your life than sin. And so we try to fill our lives with things like wealth and pleasures and status, thinking that these things somehow give us purpose or help us in our maladies. And that's why Jesus came. First, to show us our lives means so much more to God than the sum of our good decisions minus our bad decisions. Because honestly, that's how a lot of people look at this. 
I hope I've just done more good things than bad things so that when I stop breathing on this earth and I stand before God, he's going to say, oh, I got you in the plus column. And it, we're so much more than that. Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice of a, the fallen condition of your spirit and for the choices that you have made that God never intended for your life. And that goes for the good things you've tried to replace him with as well. Because anything that takes the place of your relationship with God is, that word again, sin. And that's why the first of the Ten Commandments says, you shall have no other gods before me. Because anytime you choose anything outside of what God has designed for your life, you have ultimately made it an idol and put it before him those little gods in your life are very serious to the god of your life and he was so serious about restoring you to a right relationship with him that he came to die in your place on the cross our symbol of salvation and sacrifice and that's why people shouted when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, we'll use the Gospel of Mark's recollection of it. Here's what the people said. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, which was a word reserved for worship, a word that was only used to elevate someone who was worthy of that kind of honor. And without fully realizing it, they were declaring praise, Hosanna, to the one who was worthy of their worship and not just another religious leader. They even put the exclamation point on it when they said, Hosanna in the highest, equating Jesus with the God of the universe who are, is in the highest place. That's interesting. I have a friend of mine who, who jokes with me often that he has friends who he says they need to give a little more money to their church because they're just not living right. Now, understand he knows that that's not how we get right with God, but he knows that they actually think that. That they think if I can just add a few more sacrifices to my credit, if I can just bring a few more offerings to God, that he'll look upon me favorably someday. And here's the thing. Many people believe that many people are living their lives like the temple still works many people are living their lives thinking that my sacrifices of some kind are going to be enough and the bible tells us those sacrifices aren't sufficient only the sacrifice of jesus christ is enough and so the writer repeats the beginning of Psalm 40 again, and then he says this, beginning in verse 9. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Because you see, he's showing us that not only was Jesus the ultimate sacrifice for us, He's the ultimate Savior for us. You see, God's will for Jesus' will was our salvation. Did you get that? God's will for Jesus' will was our salvation. The Bible says he sets aside the first to establish the second. And he's talking about those covenants that we've been trying to unpack together the past few weeks. God's first covenant was to bless his people who lived out their lives trusting him with the animal sacrifices. This will of God pointed to the moment when our relationship with him is repaired, or we use this word, when we are saved. And the writer quotes Jesus. Here I am, I have come to do your will. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Those words, made holy. His sacrifice bridges the chasm between our sinfulness and God's holiness. 
That is what rescues us, redeems us, restores us. We are able now to be in right relationship with God because of his salvation. The the Hebrew writer continues in verse 13. Here's what he says. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, now listen, Jesus actually battled against two different enemies. The first one is the devil himself who wants to destroy all of God's creation and especially all of humanity. But the second thing he destroyed or the second enemy he fought against was death, the consequence of our sin. And while he ultimately would defeat the first enemy when he returns and sets up his eternal kingdom, he has already defeated death with his death and his resurrection. Now look, I don't know what you get fired up about in your life, but there is nothing more exciting than the reality that I do not have to live my life in death. I don't have to fear death. I don't have to worry about what happens to me after I die because of what Jesus has done to save me. That's your salvation. That's why we call him Savior. You see, the Israelites, who these Hebrews who had been part of, were looking for a Savior. Their idea, though, was limited, that someone who would come along and in their strength and might deliver them from their oppressors and their occupiers. But God had a bigger, more lasting plan for Jesus, to be our eternal Savior over death and to deliver us from the consequences of sin right now. You, the, the blessing and the benefit of putting your faith in Christ's salvation, it's beautiful. You don't have to wait till you die to get that benefit. You can begin to understand what he meant for you all along in this life. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So the writer explains, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So not only has he made us holy by dying on our behalf, but he's also continuously acting upon us with his spirit. He is making us more and more into the image of Christ every day. And we can live a life now that's in tune with God's will, God's intent for your life, God's design for you. And we can say yes to God's plan for us, holiness, he called it, and no to idols, to rebellion, and yes, men and women, you actually can have the power to say no to a temptation to sin. Now, I don't know about you, but if if you're feeling um, overwhelmed by guilt, beat down by your failures, wondering if you could ever uh, please God and honor him in your life, his promise is that you can. You can be made holy into the image of God if you'll first trust his salvation. You know, I, I, there was a guy, a friend of mine, uh, way back a few years ago, I'd go to rotary meetings with him, and he would always, well, I have to be honest with you, he'd kind of mock my vocation, you know, us minister types. And he says, I don't see where you guys get off judging people as to whether or not they'll make it to heaven. And I'm like, hey, look, dude, I totally agree with you. I'm not the judge of people, and, and, and I, that's why I don't do that. All I do is tell people what the Bible says about being saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Then it's up to them. They make the decision as to whether or not they will choose to be right with God by trusting in that sacrifice and that salvation. So your argument isn't with me. I'm not the judge. Your argument is with God's word, and I encouraged him to read it And he did. And this is the thing I encourage all of you to understand because I'll be honest, you could sit there and I I mean, there's a lot of different people in the room today who receive this kind of word a lot of different ways. That's why I encourage you, go read it on your own. Pick up the Gospel of John and just start reading. And there you'll give God a chance to show you how he has saved you 
from the consequences of your rebellion and failure and sin. Do you need a Savior? Well, the Bible says yes. But you get to decide for yourself. But just to be honest, if you have any guilt on you that because of things that you've said or things that you've done, I think you already know the answer as to whether or not you need a Savior. But the best part is, as I said before, it's not just for when we die. Let's keep reading what the Hebrew writer wrote, beginning in verse 15. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more, and where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. I love how he unpacks this for us in just a few words. That he's, Jesus is not only our ultimate sacrifice and our ultimate Savior, but Jesus is the ultimate Spirit in us. And this is the beautiful thing about Easter. We're not just made right with God, we're also able to do right for God. You can live a life that honors him. We're able to want to embrace his design. We're able to want his will for our lives. I will put my laws in their hearts, he said, and I will write them on their minds. You see, men and women, when we believe and receive the salvation of God through faith in Jesus, he gives us his Holy Spirit. And we don't have to keep offering sacrifices because Jesus, once for all, has given the ultimate sacrifice. He's provided the ultimate salvation and now has given you the ultimate spirit to restore and revive your relationship with God. It's good news. It's like I often say in here, and I think I did even last week, it's the kind of news where if we were a jumping up and down kind of church and went a little crazy when we hear something good, that's what we'd be doing right now. Hearing that, that here comes Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, and the people who have believed his teaching and have seen his miracles are declaring reverence and worship and praise for him. And now here comes Jesus riding into your presence in the form of his Holy Spirit. And he's ready to change and empower your life, ready to transform your heart's the des desires into the desires that he intended for you when he first created you, when he first even thought of you, when he designed your life, his spirit in you. There was this guy named Ben, he, he, he came into my office, it was a few years ago, and he said, you know, I need something different because I've tried everything and it hasn't worked. And in our conversation, we began to talk together. He, he talked about growing up in an abusive home and that ultimately he, it, it created to him a lot of anger and a lot of distrust for both people who made promises to him as well as to authorities. It, it caused him to experience a lot of discouragement and, and depression, he ultimately went into the military. And when he was in the military, he was assigned to quite a few tours and experienced a lot of things that a lot of us in this room have never experienced when it comes to war. And he came home and he was really having trouble uh, dealing with all of this, from his upbringing to his uh, battle experience. And so he began to do things to try to numb the pain. And so he would drink too much, and he'd take drugs, and he'd try to, try to find pleasure and happiness in sex, and none of it was giving him the relief uh, from what he'd been experiencing all of this time. And, and so I, I said to him, look, let me just remind you of a story that you already know. But Jesus Christ came to this world to take all of that pain, all of that sin upon himself, because all of that is not what he intended for your life. He wants you to know peace. He wants you to know joy. 
And so in dying on the cross, he took all of the consequences of evil and sin upon himself so that you could be resurrected from the dead. And your life now can be a life that is resurrected from the dead. And the more we talked and the different times we got together, he ultimately decided that he believed that this was true. He received it for himself. He began to learn it every day, he'd read the word, he'd go to Bible studies, he'd get in groups, they'd talk about what was going on in their lives, and he ultimately began to live this story. And the story of Easter, the story of the cross, and the story of the empty tomb became Ben's story as well, is that he was resurrected from this dead life that he was living before he met Jesus. You see, the Easter story not only became Ben's story, it could become your story as well. You see, his sacrifice is your sacrifice. His salvation is your salvation. And his spirit can be alive in you if you'll decide today, you know what? I am a sinner. I have believed and done things and said things that have nothing to do with what God wants for my life. And so I'm going to change my mind. And I'm going to start writing a whole new story with the redemption of Jesus Christ. You know, what is Jesus brand? Well, if anything, we'd want to look at that cross right there and we'd want to say, that's where my focus is. That's where I need to put my attention because that's where the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate Savior provided my salvation and now offers me his spirit. It's that cross that can empower and guide your life. But that cross is where a new life simply begins. Does Jesus have a brand? I don't even think the cross is his brand. He doesn't have one. He doesn't need one. He doesn't want one. Because what he wants to do is not sell you something. He wants to give you something. He wants to give you someone, himself and his spirit, to totally transform the trajectory of your life. He sacrificed all to give you salvation and transformation. So the question is simply this. Do you believe it? And will you receive it? Will you join these Hebrew followers and lay down yourself and your possessions and all that you are, even your will, to worship him and honor him and trust him and live for him? When Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn and the way opened for you to meet God. And God to change you, to find his purpose, his design. And all of that can happen today, right now, in this place, in your heart. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, first we have to pause and simply thank you so much for this wonderful gift that you've given to us. Now, we could passionately pursue other things, but instead you've shown us today that we don't need those idols in our life, that you can be trusted. So I pray for every man and woman in this space who's with us online, who's hearing this truth, that your spirit would help us to believe in your sacrifice and salvation. Lord Jesus, help men and women today to confess the reality of their sin and help them today to receive your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness and to start new right now. Would you pray your own prayer in response to what you've heard? Ask for his grace in your life. Thank him for what he did for you on the cross. Tell him that you receive his forgiveness today. 
then ask him for his Holy Spirit to help you to live your life for him. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for each one who today has believed this word and has received your mercy. I pray you will begin new lives in this moment right now. And I pray that you will help all who heard to be able to testify that the Easter story is their story. And we'll thank you for what you've done for us. In the beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, let's all stand and let's sing as not just a prayer, but also a, a testimony, a declaration to the world. This is what I believe. This is what he's done for me. And I want to make sure everybody hears me shout my Hosanna on Palm Sunday.
Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne So Christ alone Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love he is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. That's our good news. That's our message to share. That's what Easter's all about. We hope that you'll be part of the Easter celebrations this week. On Friday at 7 o'clock right here in the auditorium, we're going to have an amazing Good Friday service. It'd be a great service for you to invite people to. It'd be a great service for you online to come and be in person with your church family and celebrate as we focus upon this amazing cross and the death of Christ. Then on Saturday, uh, we're going to go out and be ambassadors for Christ. As Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we're going to put on a phenomenal Easter celebration at Celebration Park for the Near East Side people and help Shepherd Community Center build their relationship with them. And as a matter of fact, we're even getting ready for that today at three o'clock in the afternoon. We are stuffing thousands, I say that, thousands of plastic eggs and I really don't want to do all 3,000 myself. Uh, so if, you, if you've got some time, 3 o'clock this afternoon can come help us. We would love that for that great event that we're going to put on uh, on Saturday. And if you want to be part of that, go online to southlandchurch.org, hit events, and sign up. Let us know you're coming because we need quite a few volunteers. And then next Sunday, an amazing Easter celebration. You don't want to miss it, and you do not want to come without bringing somebody with you. So at least make that one phone call, that one text, put it out there, invite someone to join you and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Thanks so much for being with us online, and we hope you'll stick around for just a minute as Jeff continues to share with you how you can respond to what you've experienced today at Southland. Thanks so much for being part of our service. God bless you. Have a great week.